Hi, it's Lerald, and I'm going to talk about how to tank Neltheris, but first, don't forget to like and subscribe. Okay, before we jump in, this is the root and approach I use with pugs to make things easier for uncoordinated groups in which people are expected to make some mistakes, and this is based off of one run I did last week where I was kind of reacquainting myself with the dungeon because it had been uh, over six months since I'd been in here. Relatively low level key done with Kier that I literally was just wearing the same stuff I'd finished wearing season three, and... I generally used to say that this was four keys from the range of plus two to 25, but with the key level squish, we'll say it's more four plus two to about a 12, maybe a 13. If your group is good and well organized, you can get even more aggressive than I have in this setup here with your pulls, and you definitely should do that. But I will say, generally speaking, I am making a lot of double pulls throughout this particular dungeon. So if you feel that you need to be a little bit more conservative, make fewer double pulls, do that too. Just feel free to adjust based on whether you're feeling comfortable with everybody and so on. All right, let's get right into it. So when should you do your first lust? When should you try to time your lusts? Having bloodlust for the final boss is really like a good thing. I would say generally speaking, the first pull is a pretty large pull. And as, as you can see, there's really just two guys at the front and I like to pull them over into two other big guys and then a bunch of little guys as well and hit them all with a chain. So having lust for that and being able to transition out of that into this big named guy over Sir Lahar is really good. I like a lust on the first pull, whether you're on fortified or tyrannical weak. Now, if you're maybe you're playing with a pug and you're not really like that certain on them, lusting the first boss is also OK. That first boss can be pretty rough. But after that, I would say basically if it's fortified weak, you can kind of just spend lust roughly on cooldown. OK, now let's jump into the MDT route. I will put a paste bin link in the description so you can import this MDT data, just saying that right off the bat. I also highly encourage you to use Big Wigs and Big Wigs Voice. The voice callouts for spell casts are very helpful in making sure you never miss interrupts or stuns or CCs or anything like that. So as I have already said, I like to do a big pull for the first pull, and this can require a little bit of dragging. It can be a little bit annoying on a blood DK in particular to like get these two dudes all the way over to this chain. The burning chains are kind of the big notable feature of Neltheris, and they are something that was nerfed going into Season 4, so there's not really any stats here. The way that they worked prior to Season 4, so Season 2, was that you would click them, and then you would smack them into a pack of enemies, and they would do an ungodly amount of damage, basically just, like, murder the whole pack on their own. You know, kind of kind of lame, kind of gimmicky. And now the way that they work is one person can click the chain and then slam it into a pack of enemies and they will be stunned for five seconds and take 50% more damage during that time. So still useful for a damage value. Frankly, that's not something I've ever really been a big fan of. I'm being very frank in all of these videos. I, I don't know why that's in my lexicon now, but I, I really don't love the idea of environmental junk that you can use to kind of trivialize or defeat a lot of content, but that is the big feature of this dungeon. There are all these burning chains. You get a cooldown on them. I believe it's 90 seconds. Maybe it's two minutes. I can't recall. Either way, you get a debuff when you've used one that you can't use one again for that period of time. As you can see, they're all scattered just in this first hallway on the right side. So you really just want to have somebody using one on every single pull that you can, and that basically just means every single pull throughout this whole section. So as the tank, what you want to do is you want to get those monsters gathered up and then like ping over and over again on on the skull until somebody grabs it and slams the mobs the one time. And then that's basically all there is to it. You burn them all down. You're good to go. So the second pull, I would say, is probably the most dangerous pull before the first boss, even more so than this first pull, because even though this first pull has a lot of guys in it, it's really only these two elites or two sets of elites, the Kalashi Wardens and the Kalashi Hunters, and they're really not that dangerous. The Phoenixes, as long as you pick them up and aren't letting them hit on anybody, they're really not that big of a deal. The second guy here, the second pull features over here, Overseer Lahar, and he has an interruptible spell. Uh, burning Roar, you want to kick that. It will do a knockback. It'll do a lot of damage. It can shove people into these packs over here that you don't want to pull if it goes off. Uh, you just want to shut that down. Other than that, there is a chain here that you can grab and slam into this pack of guys. And then you just sort of hug the left side wall, transition through the room, picking up these small little double pulls, slapping them with more chains and burning them down. And then right here at the door to Chargath, I like to get the 
everything that's on the close side of the door and then also the stuff that's on the far side of the door if you're really feeling up to it cooldown wise but otherwise you can split that into two poles and you're good to go then you do chargath he has been changed to be kind of brutal we'll talk more about that in his section and then there is this like very basic pull after him with a chain right at it and by doing chargath you'll have plenty of time to have that chain cooldown reset so you grab the one guy that's hanging out in the hallway by himself, he's a nerd, they threw him out of the pack, and you pull him over to the rest of the group, you chain him down, and then you transition over to this final pull, and as you can see, it's kind of big. There are a couple of guys hanging out in the front by this uh, goulash pot, and then there are a bunch of guys like up on hammocks, and you just want to pull all of them, and also the three phoenixes that are up the stairs at the end. This is maybe the most annoying part of any pull in the entire dungeon, is these three phoenixes that are up some stairs. If you're on a paladin, if you're on a even a blood decay actually, just something that can kind of tap from 30 yards away, it's not so bad. It can be a little annoying to pull those phoenixes from up the stairs. I guess double jumping and hitting them with a sigil or a glaive toss on a demon hunter is probably the easiest of any of the tanks to pull it off with, but they're a little annoying to pull down, but it's really, I think, very, very important to get them down here with basically with all the rest of the guys. I kind of like to get these five elites and the two little phoenixes stacked up and ping the chain and get somebody to slam them and then run over and pick up these little dudes and bring them in because they have so little health. You just don't want to kill all of these guys and then have to come over here and spend time just killing these little teeny tiny little birds. And then there's this Kalashi Hunter here and I'm actually just gonna add a note in addition to saying it, uh, sleeping, that she is sleeping. I think that's a lady. And sleeping, just, you know, just let her stay sleeping. There we go. Sleeping mob, just let it go. So you travel up the stairs and those stairs come out right here. And then there's a nice little double pull here. You can do this with two lava flares and a Kalashi iron torch in the one pull and a Kalashi lava bear in the next. The lava bear likes to pour lava out on the ground. So you do kind of have to move this pull around a lot. The lava flares just spam cast melt. And there was, maybe you could call it a bug, maybe it was a design, a bad design decision either way, where when you would interrupt the melt, they would just keep casting it anyway. So there was still a point to interrupt it, so it wouldn't necessarily go on the same person over and over again, but it has been changed so that when you interrupt them, they will behave like normal caster mobs now so that they will stop casting for a little bit. So you wanna just kind of burn this pack down. You can kind of start them down the stairs here where I have my mouse and then just kind of drag them up the stairs as you're moving away from the lava bearers. Uh, lava spills, lava drips. You can just kind of pull them up and toward the next pull. And then when you're leaving, when you're done with the boss, you're gonna come up here and jump down and that will drop you all the way back down here from where you started. So there are two monsters over here, two guys, uh, two lava bearers. I like to grab this five mob pat that's patrolling up and down just at the top of this little staircase here. I like to pull them and the two lava bearers together and I will kind of start them over here toward the exit and I will just kind of drag them around to move away from that lava, same sort of approach. And then you can skip the Iron Torch Commander very easily. He's worth a lot, but he's really not that efficient. Like he's not great. And he's just really kind of a pain to fight. Like it's not really that complicated mechanically. You basically just sidestep some stuff and then that's kind of all there is to it. But he has a lot of health. He is just one big mob and people don't like to do him. So even though I would prefer to do it myself, I just don't do it because I know it'll make people upset. So you just sort of clear out these little, little guys here and then you can just hug the wall and walk past them. You don't need any mind soothe. You don't need stealth or shroud or anything like that. There are four lava flares here. I like to pick all of those up and pull them into this three mob pull here and do it as a double pull, clear that out. And then you can go left or right. It, it, these are identical pulls. This right here, lava bearer and bone splitter. This right here, lava bearer and bone splitter. These are two lava flares. These are two lava flares. Same exact pulls either way. You just go down one side and then there will be a patrol out here. You'll want to get that as well. Exactly the same on either side, but you only want to do basically you just come right or you come left. Either is fine. And then you want to clear out both of these double lava flare and a blacksmith pulls that are on the opposite sides of Gorak. So normally I would come down like this, come down like this, clear out this patrol and get this uh, double lava flare and blacksmith pull with the patrol if I'm feeling comfortable in the group. And then I would walk all the way around the blacksmith and I would burn down this other pole and we would take that out and then we would fight the boss. 
once we're done, we'll leave. We'll just walk out the same way we came in. We'll hug the wall and go around the commander, making sure not to go to the right and pull this patrol. Come out, jump down, and then that plops us all the way back out over here where we started. And then we can just travel right through here to go to the next section. And we will come up the middle here, come through the middle here and come up this ramp. And then I like to do, and I didn't do this in, in the like one video, the one run that I recorded of doing it this season, but normally I have done it this way through all of season two, where I will pull all of these mobs over at this side. So there's one patrol that's kind of moving around inside and outside of this, this sort of like main round room here. And then there are two poles on either side. None of these mobs are really all that dangerous. They don't really have a ton of mechanics going on. The main one is this Thaumaturge has Molten Core that you do want to interrupt. That is really important. It will uh, do a lot of group wide damage. So you just want to kick that. But the rest of the guys are mainly just auto attackers. So you just kind of pop some major cooldowns and tank them all. So the patrol has a Thaumaturge and this one pole has a Thaumaturge. But the other guys, they're just like tank hitters. They just do tank damage. So not really that dangerous in terms of, uh, I mean, eventually they will be. It's infinitely scaling content, but for lower levels, just sort of like weekly key stuff, they're really not all that mechanically complex anyways. So I like to fight these guys all outside, and then I like to come in and I get the one pole on the right side here that is hanging out, just not moving around, and the rock patrol that are coming down the ramp. I like to pull those together and do those as a single pole. And then I do the four guys over here that are in the corner also as another pole. And then you do this pull on the way to the final boss. You want to make sure you get in there before everybody else and not give anybody a chance to get auto attacked while you're still picking up threat. Then you proceed to Magma Tusk, the third boss, probably the most annoying boss to tank of all of the bosses in this dungeon, even after the Chargath changes this season. Deal with that boss and then you're off to the end of the dungeon. You will come out this way and this one's a little bit less complicated. Basically, you jump down the balcony and you'll land right here. This might be the most dangerous pull in the dungeon. Two Kalashi Wardens and a Blazewing. The Blazewing is really the most important monster here and it only has one skill, Candescent Tempest. Candescent Tempest. Uh, yeah. The uh, bigwigs voice calls it Candescent Tempest. It's great. So anyways, it does a lot of damage and it pushes people back. And as you can see, there is sort of an edge around this this platform here. It won't kill you if you fall down, but it will knock you down into magma and then you have to make your way back out. So you just want to make sure that you're not near the edge so that you won't get knocked off by the Candescent Tempest. You also want to make sure that you're not in this area, these grates, because the grate area is uh, full of fire. It will burn people who are on the grates. The grates, not great. So you want to make sure that you're not getting killed by the Candescent Tempest pushing you anywhere that's like kind of bad. And it also does a ton of damage too at that same time while it's blowing people. So this is a real healer check. They're being pushed around, taking everybody's taking a lot of damage. And also they're struggling with like healing and not getting pushed off the platform at the same time. So if you can rally and cry, if you can use spell warding on the healer, if you can use sacrifice, if you can use druid healing, if you can use anti magic shell, anything like that, that will really go a long way toward helping the group stay alive on what is probably the most difficult pull of the dungeon. The Kalashi Wardens don't really do that much. They do a Blazing Slash, does a lot of damage. It is spell damage, so spell reflect it. They also do Volcanic Guard. It just does a big cone of damage. You just sidestep it. Very easy to deal with. Once you finish those guys off, come up here, do the one final pull with the Warden and a Lava Mancer. The main focus in this pull is to focus lock in on the Lava Mancer. They will cast a shield and then start casting Molten Army. You want to break the shield, do a ton of damage to burn down the shield, and then you will be able to interrupt the Molten Army. You want to do that instantly. I don't rely on people in the group to do that. I try to focus that as the tank, literally focus the Lava Mancer and then focus interrupt that Molten Army as soon as the shield breaks. That does mean that you will need to pick up Molten Army monsters as they appear. The Lava Spawn will show up af as like as a Lava Mancer is channeling the Molten Army. It will be spawning Molten Guides. When the Lava Mancer dies, those guys don't despawn. Bad design. Not really any other thing to say about it other than just like not good design, but it is what it is. And then finally, you have a, a horrible triple pull here with a Warden, a Lava Mancer, and an Apex Blazewing again. And you can sidestep that. I actually didn't in the uh, in the one little route that I did. And, you know, if you get to the end here and you don't have 100%, this is definitely the worst pull of the set to do. 
but it's an option. It's something you can do, I guess. I would prefer not to. Some of these mobs on the side are not linked. Some of them I think maybe are. Either way, what you can do is you can come over to the right side and there's a little bag right here where I'm like, moving my mouse. You can, in a straight line, walk right from the corner and just jump right over the middle of the bag and you won't pull this warden to the side and you won't pull this patrol or this this pack here in the middle, not a patrol, this pack here in the middle. And this pack here in the middle is actually like further back than they're indicated on the MDT. It's fine, but they're really bit, a bit more back from the entrance here. And you're able to just walk right in between with no uh, mind soothe on any of these guys at all and easily make it through if you have mind soothe if you have shroud if you have invis pots i guess then it's a really easy to get in between these two sets of guys but that is the one skip that you can do in this dungeon very easy to do and if you want to just pull the warden or something on the right hand side if you are a little short but like only one or two percent short then you could just do that and then it makes it super like completely trivial to get to the final boss and these guys are nowhere close to the final boss so there is no way that you could pull any of this really awful pull onto the boss accidentally if somebody pulls that on that's like uh incompetence or malice but definitely not like oh i accidentally ran into it you'd have to accidentally run a marathon to get into this pull all right now let's move on to the first boss and that would be chargath Chargath really only has about four mechanics, but he was redesigned in season four to be significantly more dangerous uh, to players and uh, specifically the tank. He really is a lot more dangerous to tanks than he was in season two. So let's just kind of run through his abilities and we'll start with some of the more like boring stuff. He casts Dragon Strike where he will basically just target a random player, dash to them, do a slash, do a bleed in an area around them. And that's sort of a healer mechanic. I don't know that you can dodge out of that. It never goes on the tank. So it's like just literally a mechanic I never learned. Um, I guess play a dwarf is always a good uh, advice there. He also will turn and cast a magma wave. You just sidestep that again. Very simple, very like basic mechanic then the other mechanic the one that's more interesting is grounding spear he will throw out spears at random players he'll throw them out at actually three people they'll do physical damage i think you can sidestep them and again he'll never throw them on the tank and then they apply a chain to the target now one of the changes that was made in season four that's actually like a good change a fix to a problem with him is if the people who have that chain on them die the chain won't break in the past it would so as soon as he's done that, as soon as he's chained three people, he will start spot. He will start like raining fire all over the place. He will also focus the tank, which is the main change of this fight from season two to season four. And he will start doing tons and tons of fire damage to the tank, like insane tank destroying amounts of fire damage. And this lasts for 25 seconds. Now, the way that you fix it is if you run him through the chains, three times if you run up through all three chains the chains will break doing damage over time to the group and that stacks but it will after you've broken him through three chains it will prevent it will end that channel that he's doing on the tank so what you want to do is as soon as this starts you want to pop cooldowns like pretty big ones i use divine shield in in some of this i think spell warding yourself is also justifiable this has been nerfed this damage from the fiery focus that he does on the tank has been nerfed by 25 percent in the past, this was targeted, I think, on just random targets, and it did way less damage. It was like way less of a mechanic, really. This was just basically a, not a tank fight at all. There were no mechanics for the tank. So I actually think this is a better design than it used to be, but it will shred you. So you do need to be prepared for that fiery focus when he's chained the three people and he starts doing that. That will actually be pretty nasty. You also need to be the person who drives him through the chains. And because of the way that the debuff stacks on the group, you want to drive him through one chain, have the debuff, run all the way through for just a couple of seconds until it falls off. The debuff duration is also pretty short. It's only four seconds, but it does do an initial hit of a bunch of fire damage and then a four second fire damage over time effect. So you do want to actually let that expire. Treat it like bursting, right? You want to run it through one chain, four seconds, one, two, three, four, run them through the next chain and just do that until you have gotten it through all three chains. That does mean that you will need a little over eight seconds, about 10 seconds of staying alive through that fiery focus. It's pretty tough, but if you can do it, then you're good to go. And if your healer is up for it, you can very quickly run him through two. But just like dealing with bursting, it's OK to like run him through and get two stacks quickly. It's not OK to run him through one, 
let it tick for three and a half seconds and then <laughs> run him through a second and fully extend that debuff. And that's pretty much it. All right, now let's move on to the second boss, Forge Master Gorak. This is very much intended to be the tank fight of the dungeon, and it's pretty simple once you have the handle on basically the one tank mechanic of the fight. So the main tank mechanic of the fight is heated swings. The boss will do a combo on you. He will knock you up and then punch you away. It does a massive amount of physical damage, but it's physical damage. So you can block it. You can mitigate it with armor. It's very easy to deal with. And if you pop any sort of cooldown at all, Celestial Brew, Demoralizing Shout, pretty much any defensive cooldown at all, Vampiric Blood, you're going to be fine in dealing with this. As I said, he knocks you away. He then follows that up with sort of his finisher. He will leap up in the air toward you and then slam down where you landed and uh, smash that area with a massive amount of fire damage and also a huge physical damage hit. So the way you deal with this is as soon as you hit the ground, you then move out of it. It's really that simple. This does mean that if you're on like a DK or a warrior or a demon hunter, you don't want to immune that knockback by using death's advance. You don't want to immediately charge back in or leap back in or I guess bear form charge back in or transcend its back in. I've made that mistake because if you were to transcend back into melee range, he would then jump into melee range and mess up the area right where he was standing, which would be bad. You do want him to knock you toward the edges of the room. You hit the ground and then you move out of those and then he will mess up the areas around the sides of the room. And you want to just basically paint that around the edges of the room and I'll show that on the map here. So like generally speaking, I'll even draw a little X marks the spot here. I will face him so that he will knock me over here and drop that X marks the spot for the first circle. There's a table here, like right under this pack. I will usually try to not play with that table. I'll try to set the next X marks the spot like right next to it. And then I'll try to play. If there's a third one, I'll try and set that over to the side. And then if for, there's never been a fourth one, but if there was, I would set the next one over there and so on. And so I would do that throughout the fight. I would just basically rotate him around the room just the way that he is facing, and that's pretty much it. This part of the fight is pretty easy to deal with. There's a knockback. He jumps to you and leaves a pool of, the fi of fire on the ground, and then you step away from that, and he will immediately follow it up with Forge Storm, which rains a bunch of fire down on the ground all around the room. Just like with Chargath, there's a bunch of fire raining down. Woo. And then he will jump back over to his anvil and he will start slamming hammers down. And then that spawns some stuff that other people in the group, not the tank, will have to deal with where they will launch out lines of fire. So they all have to spread out from each other and they have to sort of spread out in a geometric pattern so that they don't overlap each other with lines of fire. And then he will follow that up by doing the tank combo again. And then he'll do the out of the tank combo. He'll do forge storm. Then he'll lump jump back and smelt on his hammer or forge on his hammer. And it's just the same, basically the same trio of abilities that he rotates through with a very, very rigid structure. It's like I said, supposed to be the tank fight of the dungeon. I suppose that it is. It's probably one of the most like simple, very uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three fights that I think I've seen in quite some time. So not very complex once you get the handle on the basics of just making sure that he is throwing you away into good spots to drop fire circles on the ground and then just getting out of those. And that's pretty much all there is to it. All right, Magma Tusk is the third boss of the dungeon, and I think it is probably the most difficult boss of the four four tanks. It doesn't really have any sort of tank specific mechanics, but it does revolve around a lot of movement, a lot of moving the boss around. The facing on the boss, really the facing on all the bosses in this dungeon, I guess the second boss technically has important facing because of where he's going to knock you, but Chargath facing doesn't matter. Magma Tusk facing doesn't matter. Really, it's all about positioning, and the positioning is going to be determined by the environmental uh, fire that Magma Tusk is spawning throughout the fight. So Magma Tusk will regularly, you know, he fills up an energy bar just passively throughout the fight. And when he hits 100 energy, he will launch a bunch of fire around the room and spawn an extra magma tentacle, making him deal more damage for the rest of the fight. He has a couple of other mechanics. The main ones are a charge where he will target a random player in the group that's not you and charge at them. That can be sidestepped. He will then like once he has charged, he will charge it all the way to the wall. Once he has finished the charge, he will then radiate out some random magma waves uh, out from where he charged. So as you are running to close the gap with Magma Tusk from having 
you know, he is charged away, you're trying to get back to him. You want to make sure you're not running through those magma waves on the way back to him. This is exacerbated somewhat by the fact that he is also raining magma down throughout the whole fight because it's Neltheris. Every boss does that. So in addition to that, there is also Lava Spray, where he will target a random player and spray a cone of lava in their direction. This is easy to deal with. Everybody should just fan out from the boss. That's pretty much all there is to it. Non-tank mechanics for the fight are the lava spray that you spread out for and the charge that you point away from everybody else and then sidestep once the boss has locked his position in. And then the magma waves that come out of that that you want to avoid as you're running back to get into melee range of the boss. The only other real mechanic of the fight and the main thing that is difficult for tanks is the fire pools that the boss leaves on the ground when it rains down magma. The reason that this is uh, any sort of issue, any sort of complication is by standing in the magma pools, the boss gains 25% increased damage. As soon as you move the boss out of the magma pools, that goes away, but that means you need to constantly be vigilant on that. For one, the boss will randomly charge around, so you're not able to be in complete control of the boss's positioning all the time. It is constantly spawning magma pools, or very regularly spawning magma pools, so you need to be constantly dealing with that as well. So there is just a lot of movement requirements on the on the part of uh, the tank in this fight, and it is very improvisational. There isn't like it's basically the exact opposite of Forge Master Gorak, where it is a one, two, three, one, two, three. It's a, it's a very practiced. It's like a waltz. It's a very strict dance. Magma Tusk is almost the exact opposite. You're having to freestyle the whole time. You're having to constantly pay attention to as soon as the boss gets empowered by that lava empowerment. You want to make sure he is out of that lava before he casts lava spray onto somebody and one bangs them or casts the volatile mutation and blasts the whole group for an extra 25% damage. And so you just need to basically be looking for those lava pools, looking for that lava empowerment buff and moving the boss immediately whenever that occurs and then getting into a safe spot, which will not last for very long. And then you move again and again and again. Anyway, that's Magma Tusk. All right, Warlord Sarga is the fourth and final boss of the dungeon, and it has also, she has also gotten a change in season four, the Curse of the Dragon Horde, the debuff that she would apply whenever you pick up an item to use on her during her transition has been changed from being incredibly long, like five minutes long, but only having one stack, essentially permanent unless you have somebody in the group who can decurse. It is now 30 seconds long, so it will fall off in between times that you go click an item, but it can stack. So if you aren't able to remove it or if you don't wait long enough for it to fall off, then it can stack up and deal significantly more damage. It does deal a lot of damage as well. So Druids are at a kind of a distinct advantage over other tanks for dealing with this fight specifically by being able to dispel themselves, dispel other people in the group. It is really valuable to have somebody who can decurse. The boss will turn and blast a cone of fire. You just want to kind of step out of that. Not really anything complicated there. You don't have to face the boss in any sort of certain way throughout the fight. And movement wise, you generally don't have to move the boss very much, although the boss will spawn and add a burning ember that will fixate on somebody and try to chase them and explode. Basically, you just want to stun the burning ember over and over again. That can cause it to refixate, like CCing it can cause it to refixate on people. So you do want people in your group to be aware of that like if you have the ad fixated on a caster in the group and you hit it with a paralysis and then it refixates onto the fury warrior and they're not paying attention they get blasted that could be bad but generally speaking ccing it and burning it down hitting it with touch of death hitting it with all of your cooldowns is a good thing because that is kind of the main annoying aspect of the fight the boss will also, of course, throw some damage out at people because, you know, there wouldn't be much of a fight if there wasn't something for the healers to do or healer to do. And then finally, all right, so the main mechanic of the fight is Magma Shield. Warlord Sarga will shield herself with a very, very large shield and then start erupting for fire damage. This fire damage does ramp over time. It lasts for a very long time. So like, I guess hypothetically on a low enough key, you could do that. You could just like, I don't know, outlast it for some reason, but she's shielded the whole time. So that, I mean, there's just no point. You want to break the shield and then that will immediately end this effect. She is also throughout the whole process, of course, raining down magma, raining down fire on the group. So you want to dodge that and you want to break the shield. 
The most effective method for breaking the shield are the magical implements that are scattered throughout the room. Picking one of them up will apply that curse to you, dealing shadow damage every three seconds for 30 seconds, so it is a lot of damage. It is better to pick up those items and break the boss's shield quickly. You can pick the items up before the shield goes up. You can pick them up basically from the start of the fight, and that is kind of what you want to do. Pull the boss, grab some items, and then be ready to break the shield as soon as it goes up. But don't use the items, the extra action button items. Don't use those until the shield is active. You want to pay attention to what item you've gotten as well, because they all behave differently. The wand will just do like single target damage. The bomb, which sort of looks like a blue or green, blue green orb, will do, uh, I think, damage that you have to click on the ground. You have to actually like click a circle on the ground. The rose will cause you to explode and do damage to things that are around you. I think there used to be one that you would make you charge to the boss and do damage, but that might have been removed or I just I can't remember it. But in any case, the items all do a massive amount of damage, basically enough that a couple of them will break the shield just on their own. So if you're coordinating with other people in your group effectively, then you can use that to destroy the shield pretty quickly. And that is the goal. You kind of want to break that shield within the first couple seconds of it going up so you don't lose any uptime on the boss. You can just keep blasting her. And that's kind of all that there is to it. Because you are a tank, you are able to get away with taking the Curse of the Dragon Horde debuff basically every time you want to like pick one of those items up very early on in the fight and then as soon as your debuff falls off you know you've used an item already pick up another one kind of just repeat that throughout the fight you can definitely get away with that more than any of the dps or the healer can and that really is all there is to this fight as long as you're breaking the shields and then burning down the ad and then just like not standing in cones of fire not standing in circles of fire you're gonna be just fine all right, that's it. That's how you tank Neltheris. Feel free to ask questions if you have any, and good luck. Thanks for watching. Bye.